Good morning, I'm Erin Guy. We interrupt programming right now to bring you a breaking news news conference happening right now outside the Fort Lauderdale Airport. Let's listen in. To reiterate that this is an ongoing active investigation and to preserve our investigative efforts not only here in South Florida but really throughout the country. Uh, I will not be able to share a lot of the investigative information that we currently have. Last night, we began to process the crime scene at Terminal 2. Uh, that process has concluded, and at approximately 7.30 this morning, we return the terminal back to the local airport uh, authorities. We have po positively identified the five deceased victims, and we are in the process of notifying their family members and loved ones. We have concluded the interview of the suspect. The suspect remains in custody and is currently held at the Broward County Jail on federal charges. We are working very, very closely with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and this afternoon the United States Attorney's Office will issue a press release in regards to the charges that the suspect will be facing. We are conducting interviews and investigative leads uh, in numerous locations, not only here in South Florida, but really throughout several other locations uh, in the United States. We've conducted roughly 175 witness interviews. We've recovered uh, video, uh, physical evidence, uh, and we continue to pursue every investigative lead. We have not ruled out anything. We continue to look at all uh, avenues and all motives for this horrific attack. And at this point, we are continuing to look at the terrorism angle in regards to the potential uh, motivation behind uh, this attack. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce the director of the airport. Thank you, George. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Gale. I'm the airport director for the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. And once again, I want to start by expressing our condolences and sympathies to those who lost their lives here in a horrific event yesterday. To their family and friends and their loved ones, please keep them all in your thoughts and prayers. I want to give you a brief update on the status of the airport. As was mentioned, uh, the airport worked uh, through the evening uh, to get our airport terminal facilities back in shape. We actually began or resumed operations about midnight on some cargo and some general aviation activity, but did not resume operations for commercial service air operations and passenger service until 0500 this morning, 5 a.m. this morning, in terminals 1, 3, and 4. Terminal 2 was still closed this morning. It remains closed right now, and it is our intention that we are going to open that up uh, later this afternoon or early this evening uh, when we get it uh, ready. Yesterday's operation, uh, one of the questions was uh, how many cancellations we took. Uh, we we uh, ran about a little less than 50% of our normal operation yesterday. Today we hope to run approximately 85% of our operation. We are experiencing some, some delays and some cancellations, partly due to this incident, partly due to uh, weather and some other issues uh, around the country. One of the big issues uh, that has come up that we've received many questions on, and that is um, the issue of connecting uh, uh, passengers with some of the belongings that they left inside the terminal facilities when they evacuated. Overnight, the airport collected over 20,000 items, luggage, cell phones, laptops, uh, various personal items. We are in the process of cataloging all of those items protecting it, securing it so that we can get it back to its rightful owner as soon as we possibly can. And to that end, we're asking our passengers if they can call this 800 number. It's an intake center where they'll be able to provide information on what they're missing, missing and then we'll do our best uh, to get them hooked up uh, with that personal item as quickly as we can. That number is 1-866-435. 9355. Again, 866 435 9355. Uh, we ask for their patience and please understand that it's going to take some time to process uh, that large number of, of items, but we really feel like we need to take those steps to ensure that that personal property gets back into the hands of the rightful owner. 
So at this time, I'd like to bring up uh, Sheriff Israel for some remarks. I'm Broward Sheriff Scott Israel. Uh, I want to provide a status update and a point of clarification. Uh, we have six gunshot wound victims at the hospital. Uh, originally yesterday, we released that there were eight gunshot victims. There were actually only six. Um, three of them remain in uh, good condition. Three of the victims remain in ICU as of uh, this press conference. We will not be releasing the identity of any of the six. From a uh, point of clarification, uh, I've been asked repeatedly, why was the airport closed yesterday? Uh, when we ori originally arrived and uh, had the crime scene in the downstairs portion by baggage of Terminal 2, there weren't any plans to close the airport. However, when we received information that there was a possible active shooter and shots had possibly been fired, although the last thing we wanted to do was impede the progress and, tra and travel plans of our residents and citizens uh, in the hierarchy uh, of responsibility, preserving the crime scene came second, and most importantly, keeping Broward County and its citizens safe came first. So I made the appropriate decision to close the airport until I was sure that people at the airport and in and about the airport were safe. Uh, you're going to hear uh, from our governor now, Governor Scott. He'll be followed by Congressman Wasserman Schultz, and then we'll take some questions. I want to thank state, local, and federal law enforcement for all their hard work. Uh, this, is, this is a horrendous act. Uh, this morning, I've asked the, I've directed the state highway safety to, uh, to start helping these passengers. A lot of passengers, if you talk to them, they don't have ID. Uh, they don't have their passports. And so we have highway safety coming here and at the uh, uh, port for the cruise ship to help people get their ID. The goal is we know we can do it in Florida, but see if we can do, help with other states. We're also reaching out to the consul generals uh, to see if they can come here to help people uh, with, with their passports. We're also reaching out to the cruise lines to make sure they understand the issue that some of these passengers are having, uh, not having clothes, not having ID, and what we can do in that regard. We've reached out to the Red Cross to see they did a great job over at the uh, at the port helping the passengers yesterday and this morning. to see if they can help some uh, passengers with um, uh, luggage, clothing, things like that. The right now, I've been asking just to make sure from state level we're available. If there's any unmet needs, we don't know any uh, right now. Now we have Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Thank you Governor. I'm Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, the Airport is inclusive within Florida's 23rd Congressional District, which I have the privilege of representing. This is obviously uh, a horrific tragedy, and we are devastated that this happened in, in our hometown, in our corner of paradise. Um, and it's my role as a member of Congress to assist the governor and the sheriff and this entire team with any federal jurisdictional issues. Uh, the issues the governor just mentioned, both the question of if someone doesn't have their ID, how they can actually travel uh, without it potentially, and we're in communication with uh, the Department of Homeland Security and TSA federal officials uh, in Washington. Additionally, the consulates, while we are attempting uh, to reach out to all of them, they are closed. It's a Saturday, so we're working with the Department of State to deal with the many, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of foreign travelers who need to be able to communicate with their home countries through their consulates and try to logistically figure out if we can get some exceptions made so that we can get people on their way. Uh, and I really want to commend the sheriff, all of the law enforcement officers, the FBI, uh, the governor, as well as uh, the airport director and all their personnel. Uh, this is a tragic and difficult and challenging situation. We have a united front here. And, uh, and we really just want to extend our appreciation to everyone for their patience and understanding. Uh, from what I've been told, the passengers, uh, while obviously very stressed in this difficult situation, have really been incredible. And everybody, uh, everybody is, is just trying to get through and deal with this horrific and difficult situation. Thank you. Do we know at this time why he came to Florida, what his purpose was coming here? So do we know why he came to uh, South Florida? We're looking at that. Uh, the early indications is that there was no specific reason that he chose uh, Fort Lauderdale International Airport, uh, but we're still pursuing that and trying to really determine why he came. 
And he only had that one bag. So was it just the gun in that bag and the ammunition packed separately? Or did he have like other things with him as well? So uh, we're looking at that. Uh, we're going through the videos that we have here at the airport. We're trying to determine exactly uh, what he brought with him and things like that. Uh, I'm not uh, willing to share some of that information because it allows us to follow up. We've got some investigative leads that we want to pursue and we don't want to uh, com compromise some of those uh, investigative leads. So uh, what type of gun did he use and did he follow TSA procedures? Uh, as I had briefed last night, he used a uh, uh, semi-auto uh, handgun. Uh, it was a uh, nine millimeter. Uh, we're not ready to release the make of the, the handgun and every indication is that he did follow TSA procedures in checking in the weapon. Is the suspect cooperating? The suspect did cooperate with the interview team, which was a joint combined FBI Broward Sheriff's Office. Uh, the interview went over uh, uh, several hours and, uh, uh, and concluded uh, sometime this morning, at which point he was then transported to the Broward, Broward County Jail and uh, booked on federal charges. We're looking at not only all of the places that he has resided, but all of the places that he has recently traveled. Uh, we've got some indications of uh, 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 other locations, uh, but we're not really ready to release those again because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they provide very valuable investigative leads and we don't want to uh, compromise those. Are we prepared to say that he came here specifically to carry out the attack? Uh, indications are that he came here uh, to uh, carry out this horrific attack. We have not identified any triggers that would have caused this attack. But again, it's very early in the investigation and we're pursuing all angles and what uh, prompted him to carry out such a horrific George, attack. George, so much has been made of his mental status and, and, you know, walking into the FBI office in Anchorage and what his family has said about kind of his mental stability. What is it that keeps the door open to terrorism and, and why you don't want to rule it out at this point? Is there something that you know? So the, uh, why have we not ruled out terrorism? Uh, I will tell you because it's way too early in the investigation. We have interviewed all of his family members that we've been able to identify so far and we will continue to do that. Uh, we have interviewed him. Uh, we're looking over all of uh, his social media, uh, things like that. Uh, it's uh, giving us a picture of the individual, uh, but it's way too early for us to really rule out anything. And that's why I said earlier, we're looking at everything, including uh, potentially uh, terrorism related. A quick follow up to that, is there something specific though that would, that would indicate terrorism to some kind of nexus or connection? Again, it's uh, too early in the investigation for me to really uh, divulge any of the uh, uh, evidence or intelligence that we've collected uh, because we do want to pursue several investigative leads that are really critical uh, to uh, give us a, a better understanding of not only the individual but the motive. So for me to make any comment now would uh, really hamper our investigative efforts. So was uh, our behavioral analysis folks involved in the uh, contact with them at our An Anchorage office? It is very normal for citizens to walk into the FBI uh, field offices throughout the country. The office, uh, our FBI offices are open to the general public and we welcome citizens to come forward and provide us information and assistance. So it is uh, available and open to, uh, to our uh, community. So he walked in uh, as uh, anyone has the right to do so. It was during that contact that the agents themselves noted the uh, erratic behavior that concerned them and uh, motivated them to call the local authorities to have him uh, taken into custody and, and uh, 
uh, evaluated uh, at a uh, medical facility for his mental health. But then that he's still able to check a weapon on the plane. Is there a disconnect there, do you think? You know, I, I'm not in a position to, to answer that. Uh, uh, again, it's really too early in the uh, uh, investigation to determine any of those uh, uh, answers. Would the shooter have known problems with law enforcement? I think it's uh, too early in the investigation to know whether the individual was a, a problem to, uh, uh, to a law enforcement. And as I've reiterated, we do have uh, quite a, a bit of investigative leads that we want to pursue. So we're trying to preserve some of those because it does give us the ability to maximize the in investigative efforts of those of those leads. Would you ever place on a no-fly list? Uh, was there an altercation on one leg of this flight? We have not uh, identified an altercation either on the flight or at baggage claim, but again, it is very early in the uh, uh, investigation. Uh, we have conducted hundreds of uh, witness interviews. We have not completed all of those, including all of the passengers that were on that uh, aircraft uh, on both legs. So once we've concluded that, we'll be able to, to say with some certainty on whether there was, but currently there is no indication that there was an altercation. Uh, preliminary information is that he was not placed on a no-fly list. George, does it look like the shooter had any help? Uh, I'm sorry? Does it look like the shooter had any help at any point along the way? So, did the shooter have any help? At this point, uh, it appears that the shooter was uh, acting alone. But again, as I mentioned, it's very early in the investigation. Uh, we're still going over a significant amount of investigative leads that we've collected uh, not only here in South Florida. Our Anchorage office is actively involved in supporting this investigation, so we're trying to determine uh, whether he truly was acting alone or not. Was this something that took a lot of planning? I'll uh, turn that question. at the airport will continue it for an undetermined period of time. Uh, many of our uh, deputies on duty and uh, a SWAT element are out here. Uh, they are carrying long guns um, and we'll uh, evaluate it. Go forward. Do you have any plans for future security going in long term? Well, like any incident, there'll be a thorough debriefing. Um, we'll, we would do that on any critical incident. We'll look at what happened and then we'll make uh, you know changes or keep things going and it'll either uh, substantiate what we've been doing or possibly we might need uh, to go in a different direction but we'll evaluate that after we uh, go through the uh, after action report. Can you talk a little bit about the protocol of closing the airport? There were a lot of people asking questions that were in Terminal 1 watching the responders coming to uh, Terminal 2 but were able to still go back to Terminal 1, go through security, then get to their gate. Why wasn't the entire airport shut down when shots were fired? It actually was. When shots were fired, uh, at that point, uh, I spoke with the airport director. Uh, we shut down the airport. We had SWAT teams from Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami-Dade, uh, many of our local cities, the Broward Sheriff's Office. Uh, we had FDLE on the ground. We had the FBI on the ground. And we were going through parking garages. It is a voluminous airport. It's a mammoth project. And it takes hours and hours and hours to clear. And there were thousands and thousands of people. So you can't say, I'm going to shut down the airport and it's shut down. There are still people that you have to take care of. There are people on tarmacs, on planes. So the performance of law enforcement, uh, not only at the Broward Sheriff's Office, but our federal, state, and local partners was absolutely exemplary. I, I was never more proud of law enforcement. And uh, uh, we did the best we could. And uh, we did a, a, an excellent job. It wasn't perfect. but. You won't expect it to be perfect when faced with those type of circumstances. Sure. From the moment the first shot was fired, how long did it take your deputy who ended up encountering the gunman? About, seven, about 70. The question was, uh, from the moment the first shot was fired, how long did it take our deputy to come in contact with Santiago? And it was approximately 70 to 80 seconds.
Well, I think the general safety, the question is about what do I think of the general safety of airports? Um, I think the, the safety at airports is, is phenomenal. When you have a person that could be suffering from a severe mental illness, or you have what we call a lone wolf assassin that's ready to uh, conduct some cowardly, heinous act, there's not much law enforcement or anybody else can do about it. That's why we train. The most important thing is mitigation and our ability to respond and, 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 and lessen the loss of lives. And I think we've done a phenomenal job about that. A conversation that needs to happen certainly is we need to talk about as a country going forward when people are on no fly lists and you know people suffering from mental illness, uh, you know they're, they're not problem people. We all know they're people with very real problems, but if they are suffering from a mental illness or they're on a no-fly zone, uh, on a no-fly list, or they're a convicted felon, they flat out shouldn't be allowed to own handguns or rifles. We have, and you can. Uh, can I ask a congresswoman a question with the congresswoman? Ma'am, it was a surprise to a lot of people that you could actually travel with a gun and ammunition. People who don't follow, you know, don't know about that or don't do it. I wonder, as the representative of this area, a lot of people have asked the question, should that allowance be revisited, uh, given what happened here? And that it appears the shooter did everything he should have done to follow the rules to check the ammunition of the gun. I wonder what your opinion is as to whether that allowance should be Right, federal rules do allow for firearms to be carried on, uh, carried in checked baggage, not uh, in, in carry-on baggage, and there are procedures that were followed in this case. Uh, I'm going back to Washington on Monday uh, when we go back into session, and that is absolutely something that I think we need to revisit. Um, we have revisited our security measures at airports every time we've had a, a security breach while we take a look at balancing the public's need to be able to freely travel, at the same time we need to protect the traveling public who is traveling alongside someone who may decide to do them harm. If you remember when we had the shoe bomber, the so-called shoe bomber, who you know, tried to light his shoes on fire in, an, in the air with a cigarette lighter, and we subsequently decided to ban cigarette lighters from carry-on bags. We can't travel with more than a certain amount of liquid because there was an individual on a flight who tried to use a small amount of a liquid to detonate as an explosive device. And like this tragic incident, there's no question that we need to review not only the question of whether people should be able to travel but with their firearms, even if they're in checked baggage, but I think we need to look at, uh, take a hard look at the security around baggage claim areas. and and not just leave it at that. I mean, I think it's been important over the last uh, you know, 12 to 15 hours that it's been pointed out that there are many unsecure areas in, in facilities that the public travels, train stations, port terminals, uh, and baggage claim areas. So certainly those procedures need to be reviewed, and I'm going to be addressing that when I go back to Washington. I have a question for Mark Gale. I just want to thank everybody from law enforcement for working together so cohesively. Um, you know, there's a, there's a saying that when critical incidents happen that uh, we don't rise to the occasion, but we actually sink to the level of our training. Uh, and that's why it's so important to train hard, and we do. Um, law enforcement was phenomenal yesterday. I pray, and I know all of the nation prays for the families and those lo that lost their lives. Um, and Vita will be telling you when our next uh, update will be. Thank you. Quick question for Mark Gale. Mark? Mark. You were just listening to a news conference right outside the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. The FBI, the Broward County Sheriff's Office, Congressman Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Governor Rick Scott all speaking there along with the airport director. Really a big headline I want to remind you about. They're saying now that there were six gunshot victims taken to the hospital. That number down from eight. We know three of those people in good condition this morning. Three of them in ICU. They say they are not going to be releasing any identities anytime soon. They're also saying the suspect who is in Broward County Jail this morning after being booked early this morning, Esteban Santiago. They said that he did cooperate with investigators during a series of um, interrogations by the Broward County Sheriff's Office and the FBI. He will be in federal court on Monday, of course. We will be there as that unfolds. When it comes to the airport, we can tell you they said that they're hoping to have 85% of operations up by the end of the day. 
Uh, they opened this morning about five o'clock. Again, there are 20,000 items left behind. They are trying to do what they can to help get that to some of those people. There's a number one eight six six four three five nine three five five. That's on the website um, on WPBF.com. So if you want to check that, if you have any information in the meantime, our coverage continues on our website, WPBF.com. And if there are any updates, we will bring them to you. Have a good day.